Okay. I would like to uh, I would now like to call the June 11th, 2024 Longmont City Council regular session to order. The live stream oh there we go. The live stream of this meeting can be viewed on the city's YouTube channel or the longmontpublicmedia.org watch or Comcast channels 8 or 880. Um, can, um, can I have a roll call, please? Absolutely. As you can see, Mayor Peck is absent. So Council Member Christ? Present. Mayor Pro Temi Dagoferin? Here. Council Member Martin? Here. Council Member McCoy? Present. Council Member Rodriguez? Here. Council Member Yarbrough? Here. Mayor Pro Temi of a quorum? Okay, let's stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, okay so... In accordance with the council's rules of procedure, the rules for the following um, providing public comment are as follows. Only Longmont residents and employees of the city of Longmont may speak during first call public invited to be heard. You must provide your address on the sign up sheet before the meeting or I will call um, or when I call your name. Uh, each speaker is limited to three minutes. Anyone may speak on second reading or public hearing item and you and you are asked to add your name um, to the speaker list for a specific item before any meeting. Um, anyone may speak on final call public invited to be heard. Members of the audience shall refrain from disruptive, vulgar, and abusive language, applause, heckling, and other actions that interfere with the orderly function of council. The chair may recess or call to adjourn the meeting if after three attempts to maintain the orderly function of the council are ignored. Um, so we have now on our agenda, the approval of minutes for the May 28th, 2024 regular session. May I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Okay, so um, we, it, the minutes are uh, moved by um, Council Member Yarborough and seconded by Council Member Christ. Um, are there any discussion on the, the minutes? Okay, can I have a vote, please? Okay, um, the minutes passed unanimously um, with Mayor Peck um, out. So um, do we, are there any agenda revisions? Mayor Pertum, I just point out that we did provide a revised uh, agreement for item, let me find the number, item 9F, mm -hmm. um, and I emailed you all about that, so that was replaced um, yesterday okay. afternoon. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you, John. Um, and then are there any motions from council for future agenda items? Um, yes, council member Christ. Um, I just wanted to make everyone aware that uh, next week on Tuesday I'm at CML and likely I'm, I'm scheduled until 6.30, so likely will not make it back for LHA next week. So just okay. an announcement. Okay. So, um, and we don't have to, we don't have to act on that, so no. we're good to go. <laughs> we're good. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay. Um, so does the manager have a report? Uh, Mayor Council, um, I do have a report. I don't have a report, but tonight on consent agenda, there's two items related to the uh, youth council. Um, and we wanted to take this opportunity to let the, um, Youth Council candidates introduce themselves to you all. So, Jenny, do you want to kick it off? The other right? <laughs> there we go. Okay, here we go. Um, good evening, City Council. Uh, thank you for having us today, and thank you, uh, Harold, for offering this time for us. So I would like to bring up Catherine Koo, who will uh, share a little bit about what Youth Council has been up this year. Uh, 
Hello, I'm Catherine Sui, and I'm the president of our Longmont Youth Council. So our Youth Council is composed of enthusiastic young leaders from various backgrounds dedicated to addressing youth-related issues in our community. This year, we witnessed record participation with 26 members representing different areas of the Longmont community. And after increasing our Youth Council membership almost threefold, it became crucial to enhance our team dynamics through activities focused on team building and leadership development. These experiences have not only nurtured growth as a cohesive team, but also empowered members to become more effective leaders, enabling them to drive meaningful change in our community more effectively more efficiently. Our notable achievement last year was managing the Million Dollar Youth Grant Program, allocating funds from the Metro District Grant Fund for youth activities in Longmont. After rigorous training on equitable grant distribu distribution, members awarded grants to 43 projects out of 53 applicants, enhancing our community's youth program significantly through the following focus areas. Health, well-being, and mental health, education, skill building, and life skills, sports and the promotion of physical activity, and arts, nature, science, technology, engineering, math, and esports. In addition to grants, we engage in several uh, service projects. For instance, in our Halloween for the Hungry event, we collaborated with Timberline Pre-K to 8, collecting 187 donations for the Round Pantry while creating a safe space for local children to participate in a trunk or treat. We volunteered for the Longmont Lights event uh, by dressing up as characters and helping spread holiday cheer. We also promote literacy through book package assembly and distribution through the Longmont City Council Book Club. We deeply appreciate the City Council's support and are proud to represent Longmont's youth. We look forward to acknowledging outgoing members and introducing you to the members who will continue creating positive change in our city. Should city council members have any questions or require additional information, please contact Jenny Diaz-Leon at 303-774-3754. Thank you so much for city council support. Thank you, Catherine. All right, what I would like to do next is invite uh, the outgoing members to step forward. So we have, uh, and I'm going to read all of the students. Uh, so we have Raj John, Bushali John, Greta Stouch, Uma Champ, Rowan Keller, Rima Bashi, Om Singh, Jeanette Valenzuela, Koshik Shandana, and Braden Saunders. Now for our uh, reappointed members, hopefully, our, our candidates. Uh, we have Brooklyn Baum, Brooklyn Goldstone, Catherine. Mary Yach, Estella Mendoza, Catherine Butcher, Alexa Mesa, Rihanna Karki, Molly Riddle, Alifonsa Perez, Bridget Dermody, Gabe Cardenas, Julissa Enriquez, Alexander Javier Esquivel Barrios, James Noel, Deja Marlene Bonilla, Matilda Garcia Stevenson, Tiara Ramirez, Din Pham, Paxton Zhu, Devin Nicholas Melton, Angel Co, Nayeli Cano Montes, Ariana Nicole Bar Be Berenjano Pomo, Renee Tornhill, Emily June Tornhill, and Claire Jensen. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny, and the Youth Council. So, okay, very good, thank you, uh, thank you City Manager. Um, so now moving on to special reports and presentations. Our first uh, presentation is from the Senior Citizens, uh, C Senior Citizens Advisory Board for their uh, 2024 presentation. Do we have any mem um, members of staff or the advisory board coming to speak? Mayor Pro Tem, I apologize for interrupting. We are having uh, a technical issue in the back. Could we take a five minute technical break before Ronnie Manus and the team get going? Sure. Thank you. Apologize. So we call for a five minute break? Just a five minute break. Five minute break. Yes. Okay. Thank you.
Okay, so it looks like the technical issues were resolved. So we're going to come back partly resolved. So we're going to go ahead and continue with the meeting. Um, so we are now at item seven, special reports and presentations, um, Senior Citizens Advisory Board 2024 presentation. Good evening, Council. My name is Ronnie Manis, and I am the Senior Services Manager for the City. I'm here tonight as the staff liaison for the, I'm sorry, for the seniors, <laughs> for the Senior Citizens Advisory Board. I'm here tonight to introduce Dave Brenna, uh, the, the chair. Uh, Dave is here tonight to present the board's 2024 annual report and recommendations. At this time, I'd like to invite Dave Brenna. All right, thank you. Turn on my timer. Um, before we get started, I, I want to make a uh, confession that I am very hard of hearing, as my board members, uh, fellow board members know. So I have a microphone right here, so I'm going to turn it on. There we go. And I'm going to put it right here, and that helps uh, me hear, to hear everything. So, with that out of the way, well, it's not quite everything. I, as long as I'm here, I thought that I'd advocate for the hearing uh, disabled a little bit. It would be really nice if the technology exists to put closed caption up on those monitors, because I've been at these meetings before, and I can't hear half of what goes on. And that's the way I watch TV. You know, I just, that's, I watch the closed caption. So, just a thought. Uh, for you to consider. Um, I'll start by saying that uh, I think it's fair to say, easy to say, I'm confident to say, that the uh, board members all support your council priorities, particularly transportation, housing, and equity. Now, we think of equity as being a little bit differently maybe than you do, but when we say equity, what we're talking about here is making sure that all the services and programs are available to all the seniors in, in the community. Uh, they do a pretty good job, but we're not quite sure we're there uh, 100%. Um, next slide. If you think there's... A, there's an advisory board that doesn't work hard. You're wrong about that. The members of the board work their butts off, all, uh, especially on a couple of committees. It's been a lot of hard work for everybody. I just want to say that about the board. Um, customer service survey. We were wondering about how satisfied people are uh, with the services that they receive at the senior center. So we did a survey. And we had 551 responses. And we asked three basic questions. And they were about classes and resources that might be available to them. Uh, what are your needs? And are your questions answered? And did you get the information that you wanted? Results were very favorable. favorable. We got about a 94, 95 uh, satisfaction rate. And so that was good information, at least for moving in the right direction. Uh, I don't know if you folks are a fan of 60 Minutes. Last fall, I think it was fall, maybe it was summer, the uh, 60 Minutes had a piece, 15, 20 minutes, on the Arapaho, um, the Arapaho Relay Horse Race. And it was very good if you watched it. We had a board member that went to that uh, uh, relay. And it was part of the uh, Sister Cities Initiative with the Arapaho Elder, with the Apro, uh, Arapaho tribe. I understand it was absolutely a blast. I'm sorry I missed it. 
but uh, I think it went a long ways to establishing the foundation of that sister city's relationship with the Arapaho uh, tribe and their elders and our elders. A new staff, uh, recreation program coordinator. We helped advocate for that last year and we did manage to get a uh, recreation program coordinator, uh, bilingual, I believe, and uh, so she's been on board for uh, several months. And so that uh, took a fair amount of uh, time uh, to uh, put the information together for to support a recreation programs uh, coordinator. The board membership, uh, I don't know if you know, but this year we went from eight members to nine members, although we have a vacancy right now. Uh, for the first time in a long time, we have four men and five women, although, as I say, we've got a vacancy. And they come from all kinds of different backgrounds. And I think the good thing is that we have a real diverse board that I, ref I think reflects the uh, composition of the community. And so we get all kinds of different viewpoints that way. We did another uh, community survey that uh, we didn't do it, but the, uh, the city marketing research department section, whatever it's called, did a survey for us and we had uh, over 900 responses to that survey. And we found that what we're trying to get there, as it says, is participation, how many people actually come. So of the 900 people that responded, we had two-thirds had been to the senior center during the last year. Uh, that's, I, I think that's pretty good. Their big issues were uh, the things that they inquired about, the things they uh, wanted to know about, were classes or participated in were classes Fitness exercise is always big. Day trips, and it wasn't quite as high, but counseling, caregiving were also big items. And the biggest barrier, you probably, I don't know if you would have guessed this, but the biggest barrier to the services that they wanted was weekends, evenings and weekends. So Ronnie has uh, taken action to expand the hours, and that'll start in September, isn't it? And so we'll be, exp uh, uh, have more people uh, with access to the center, mainly the younger seniors. Uh, and then the, fi uh, the last one, the focus subcommittees. We did form some subcommittees last, uh, uh, last summer, and uh, they were, we didn't really call them uh, subcommittees, we called them working groups. I guess you can't really call them subcommittees because we, they weren't three member working groups, they're one or two member working groups. Next slide. This is really shortening it and summarizing it, but our, we see our job is to provide input to you, but it goes the other way too. We would like to see some input from you whenever you have something you'd like to know about, some program or service or characteristics of the demographics, we'd be happy to put that together. You can, put the, you can uh, communicate that through, obviously, Harold or Christina or Ronnie, whoever. Support management, support management and staff, now technically, that's not our charge. Our charge is to be advisory to you, but on the other hand, we can't help but feel that we need to support the staff. Uh, we want to support um, the staff through getting all the resources that we can from any place. And so that's what, that, that's what we try to do. Get them, the, get them the support so they can provide the services that the seniors in the community need. Our research focus has been housing, transportation, and outreach. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But there's one new one that I, that's not on there, and that is food insecurity. We're considering pursuing that one. I don't know if you know, and I f saw this statistic from one place, and I think it's supported by other sources. One of the 13 seniors is food insecure. 
I mean, that's a lot. It's really funny, you know, a country as wealthy as this, that we have that kind of statistic. So anyway, uh, that is a, uh, a working group that we're probably going to establish and probably have some recommendations for you next year. And then the last major thing is, uh, to, is to make an annual report to the city council. Next slide. <coughs> uh, now I'm going to introduce the vice chair, that's Lonnie Dooley, and she has been working, she and a, another person have been working on housing for the last several months. And Lonnie, I'll let you take, care, take it from here. Hi, my name is Lonnie Dooley. Um, good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and Council Members. I am the Vice Chair, um, as, as David said, of the Senior Citizens Advisory Board of Longmont. Our board's job is to help determine the needs of uh, older residents in Longmont and to advocate for those needs. Some ways that we do that is we by supporting the management and the staff at the Senior Center and by reporting back to Council what we find out. I chose housing as an area of research because I live at Village on Main, an LHA property. Um, Longmont, uh, I spoke to staff members to research the housing situation. City staff, Senior Center staff, um, community leaders, community groups, and other shareholders. Um, we determined that Longmont needs more affordable housing, which would include older, um, of all age groups, which would include older adults and veterans. Here are some of the recommendation, recommendations we make. Um, we recommend the continuation of low-cost housing properties co-sponsored by LHA, BCHA, City of Longmont, and private developers. We recommend affordable housing living facility possibly in partnership with the city and a private developer that would accept Medicare and Medicaid. Um, for those who don't know, uh, the projection is by 2030 that the senior population, excuse me, the older population of Boulder County, 65 and older, will be 20% of the population or more. And we need to prepare for that. Um, we also suggest a program where shared housing or cohabitation opportunities for our underserved communities, such as older adults, veterans, and the unhoused, be prepared. If there was a program where they could actively share housing or cohabitate without losing any of their benefits, it may encourage a lot of people, and it may help a lot of people. Um, to, get to get permanent housing. We also recommend the return of safe lots, which is the program where our church's parking lots were opened up and um, we've possibly, we recommend possibly it being funded by the city and or private organizations. I personally had experience with safe lots because I volunteered at Westview Presbyterian Church and that's where one of the Safe Lots programs was. It was a safe place that they could park overnight, they could use the building, they could use the facilities, take showers, prepare meals, and they also got counseling. There were um, staff members there overnight to help people with suggestions, help, anything they needed. I thought it was a very successful program, however, um, they lost their funding. So we recommend looking into bringing that back to Longmont. Um, we also recommend a review of the current zoning laws to allow for duplex and higher density housing. And the last one is we recommend the addition of daycare programs for older adults. And the reason for that is because day, um, older adults only have three options, independent living, expensive assisted living, or long-term care. If there was a place that they could go during the day and check in and get checked on, and have activities and be kept busy, they may be able to stay in independent living longer than they may have been otherwise they would have been able to. And that's the end. Thank you very much for everybody. From Thank you for the council and your time and your attention. If anybody has any questions, we'll answer them at the end, I guess. That's fine. 
Right. One ahead of me. All right. Transportation. Um, we can cover this fairly quickly. I think everybody agrees that there is a need for transportation. There's a lot of activity going on in the city right now. We, you know, we know that. Um, older adults need more options to get around. A lot of them have problems with doctor appointments, personal care, uh, worship, whatever. And transportation problems, if you've ever worked with this, with uh, people that have these kinds of needs, um, you know that they, they compound. If you have a transportation problem, you can't get to the doctor. If you can't get to the doctor, you get sick. And if you get sick, you can't work. And it just, it just kind of snowballs. And it gets worse and worse and worse with some people. So uh, we need as many uh, transportation options as possible to overcome some of the limited mobility, health issues, income, and other issues. Um, we fully support the microtransit system, the Firestone, uh, Firestone Logmond Hub, local buses, RTD options, really anything that helps the seniors get around. Um, Phil, uh, what's his last name? Uh, yeah, Phil Greenwald has briefed our committee a couple of times, uh, and it's very good, and we're following that closely, and we support all of the stuff that he does. And as a matter of fact, we have one of our members is on the Transportation Mobility mm -hmm. Workforce, or Task Force, whatever it's called. And our bottom line here is that uh, actually some people can't even afford bus fare. Some of the lower income people, they just have a hard time getting around by any means. Therefore, we support, we fully support discounted, not necessarily free, rates for older adults. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Staffing. I don't know if you uh, have been to the senior center, talked to a resource specialist. But resource specialists are the unsung heroes of the, of the uh, senior center, I think. They're key. They coordinated assessment and referrals for over 1,300 seniors. That means that they had 1,300 people they sent different directions, all kinds of different sources. There's all kinds of sources within the community, but you have to know what they are. You have to know how to get to them. You have to have that tech technical expertise to help in that way. We had, uh, we had quite an increase, increase of 832 to 220, or a 63% increase in the last few years. And I don't know exactly what all the reasons are, but I think uh, COVID might be part of it. Population increase might be part of it. Um, I think the economy differentially affects different parts of our uh, local population. Medical costs have gone up. So there's probably a variety of sources. That increased volume has resulted in a wait time of four to five weeks. It used to be more. It used to be six to eight weeks on this one. That's, that's no good. That's not acceptable. So that's why our top, that's a, one of our top priorities as far as recommendations. Therefore, we recommend an additional two resource specialists and one administrative assistant I talked to a couple of the resource specialists last week, and we, they were very good. And I got a feel for the kind of problems that they deal with. And I, I said, how do you feel about all of this? And she said, we are absolutely bursting at the seams. They're just beyond you know, what, what they can handle. So that's part of the reason that we feel it's really essential that you consider a, a, a additional staff for those kinds of services. Um, I should have said that uh, it's not just the, acti the dealing with the people themselves, but there's a lot of related uh, support activities that go on. There's background research, contacting agencies, clerical work, paperwork, all of that stuff, it all adds up, and that's why we think that an administrative assistant would be necessary. So I'm going to leave you with this. 
Um, after I talked to those resource specialists, uh, specialists, I started thinking, what would, you know, what would I do? So imagine, if you're 75 years old and you had diabetes, and you had a spouse, 75 years old, with dementia, and you've been caring for your spouse for who knows how long, and she's he or she is getting worse. You have a house or an apartment you've been living in for 10 years and you can't afford it because you, the only income you have is Social Security. So it's a situation that gets intolerable. So you decide, I, I've heard that the senior center can help. So you get, you get on the bus, you go down to the senior center, and you talk to the people at the front desk. And they said, oh, we'd love to help you. We have all kinds of resources. But you're going to have to wait five weeks because we're overwhelmed right now. That's no good. Can you imagine being in that situation and having to wait five weeks? So that's why it's one of our top priorities. And we challenge you to think about that. And thank you for your time. Any questions? Thank you. Um, do we have any questions from council? No? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Oh, thank this you. was very informative. I appreciate the, the written report as well. Okay. So, thank you. Um, so the next item, um, item B, the LEDP quarterly report, quarter four from 2023. So we have Aaron. Fostick coming up. Any any other staff presenting? Just you. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem Hidalgo Faring and members of council. I'm Aaron Fosdick with the Longmont Economic Development Partnership. We're here this evening to provide an update to you. You may recall that we update council quarterly. The last time we had an opportunity to speak with you was actually at your retreat. And so tonight we just wanted to provide some information on activities and efforts that we've been focused on over the past several months and obviously answer any questions. Um, tonight's a little different. I don't have all the slides that were included in your packet, but I'm happy to answer any, any questions that you have, but I thought it might be more informative for council if we just talk a little bit more about the things that we've been focused on. Just as a quick reminder, um, we partner with the city and really appreciate our partnership with the city um, and our other economic development workforce and education partners. We're really focused on leading a comprehensive collaborative economic development strategy that's really all about promoting and supporting the economic health of Longmont. So we are a public-private partnership. We do continue to rely on funding from the city and other public entities as well as private investors. Um, but really what we're focused on is bringing together community leaders to help identify issues, solve problems, and recognize opportunities. And so we're really focused on that vibrant and inclusive local economy um, and making a dent in issues and again recognizing opportunities through collective impact. So since we've last spoken and over the course of my tenure in the last year, um, we have been focused on reestablishing and strengthening some of our partnerships. We have a lot of new folks in the community leading some of our partner organizations. You'll hear from Visit Longmont here in a bit. 
Um, but we've been really working on bringing our advanced Longmont ecosystem back together and thinking about all the ways in which we can identify areas for collaboration to make sure that we're making the most of our limited resources and that we're moving the needle on the important economic issues in our community. Um, we've also been working closely with um, our partners at the Chamber and the Downtown Development Authority to better understand what are our, where, does our, where do our policies and strategic plans align so again that we can be um, moving the needle on issues that are important to folks in Longmont. Just a quick reminder, our economic development strategy is centered on five focus areas, and these are um, identified in Advanced Longmont 2.0, which I know Council is familiar with. We are really charged with leading on industry and talent, and we'll talk a little bit more about what some of the work that we're doing vis-a-vis uh, -vis our contract with the city, but also want to point out that we do lean in and support our partners at the city, the DDA, and other organizations around place, connectivity, and again, really looking at how do we have the greatest impact, how do we work together um, to solve problems and to unite organizations to make sure that we are making a difference. The city does contract with us, and again, we really appreciate the partnership with the city. Really excited. Um, the city has a new uh, redevelopment manager, Laura Moody, so we're really excited to start working more closely with her, and I know council will have a chance to, to meet with her. I won't ask her to come down um, today, but we're really excited about that additional uh, staff partnership and, and seeing what we can do, but really we are charged with overall strengthening our competitive position within Longmont, um, making sure that we're marketing Longmont both nationally um, and increasingly so more globally, um, supporting the retention and creation of quality jobs, making sure that there's opportunities for our residents. And we particularly work in four key industries, um, but also focus generally on advanced industries. So we're really focused on aerospace, life science, food and beverage, as well as information technology. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that we're doing. Um, we also continue to look for opportunities to advance um, entrepreneurship and innovation. I think this is an area where we can really lean on some of our other partners within the workforce, education, and other economic development organizations to, to figure out how we can better support entrepreneurs in Longmont. And then finally, you know, at the end of the day, we're all really working to advocate on behalf of Longmont businesses, as I know Council is. So a couple of the things I want to talk about um, relate to marketing. One of the things that we're really excited about that just launched this year is the Colorado Hub for Health Impact. Have a couple notes here. Um, we are a partner in this campaign that really is supported by the Colorado Bioscience Association. They're leading the efforts to bring together life science promotion um, in Colorado, and we've joined with 22 other economic development organizations and industry partners to really promote Colorado. We know here locally that we have great access to talent, infrastructure, and opportunities, but we want the rest of the world to know that. Um, so we're promoting ourselves as that ideal destination for talent, investment, and industry location. And so this is a national marketing campaign that we are supporting. Um, and we're really focused on six areas, and you can see those here. Those are talent, inclusivity, capital and growth, location and real estate, lifestyle and culture, community and infrastructure, and cost and incentives. And so the reason that we're focused here is because Colorado already has a lot of assets. We have the number one concentration, for example, of biomedical engineers and bioengineers in the country. These are folks that can help fill these jobs. Um, we have a lot of investment in life sciences. We've had several years running where we've raised over $1 billion in life sciences investment. Not we, LEDP, I have not done that, um, but the state as a whole. Um, as you know, we have five stellar research universities. We have 30, over 30 federal labs, and this is really the kind of environment that these companies want to locate in and that this talent wants to locate in. So we're working with our partners to um, continue to promote the state, the region, but also promote us locally. We have some really great real estate resources, for example, the newly renovated Max Tech Center. We have great partnerships with the St. Vrain Valley School District and some of their P-Tech programs and other work-based learning programs, so we're really excited about this opportunity. Also quickly talk about some of the work we're doing to support the semiconductor industry. Um, council passed a resolution earlier this year to um, that was the first step in us forming a chip zone in Longmont. The Economic Development Commission of Colorado designated the Longmont Chip Zone earlier this year, and we've been busy promoting this. So um, as you can see, our Chip Zone complements the already formed Enterprise Zone in Longmont. That's what's shown here in purple. And we already have a number of great companies located in the Chip Zone. 
And so this program will really provide tax credits, not only for businesses that are existing and want to expand, like Micron, um, but also can be an attraction. And so we've had the opportunity to work with our partners at the state to talk with folks that are thinking about locating in Colorado, either from somewhere else in the nation or um, even more commonly folks from outside the United States. So we have a delegation from Taiwan that's coming to Colorado in the next couple of weeks, and we'll have an opportunity to promote Longmont, the Front Range, and the state to them. And these are some of the tax credits that semiconductor industries are eligible for because we have the chip zone. We're also working closely with OEdit. We applied for a marketing grant, and so we're hoping that we can get funding to do something similar to what we're doing for life sciences, but really to talk about the infrastructure, the talent, the industry support that Longmont has for semiconductor companies. I want to touch quickly on prospect activity. Um, you know, we are really uh, the agency that works closely with the city to bring industry and to support existing industry and expansion. And so we work with a number of different sources on that. Our regional partners at NOCO Ready, Metro Denver EDC, our state partners at OEdit, and then um, our local broker community is extremely important. And so um, prospect activity seems like it's ticking up a bit. Um, we have 22 prospects that we've received this year. Eight of those we've responded to, and we have about 18 in the pipeline currently. And if you're wondering how that math works, um, some of them are multi-year. And so it, takes, it can take a while for a company. Um, you know, we have some that are international, some that are locating from other states, and then some that may be um, local more local to Colorado. Also have been having some good conversations with um, the city and folks that are part of the development review committee and the planning team about how we make sure that we are able to respond quickly and efficiently to these prospects um, so that we can be included when these folks um, respond to companies. This is more of a plug, um, but just to let you know, we spend um, some time every single year collecting survey data from Longmont's primary employers. And so we have about 300 folks that are on our list. We try to collect information um, about the company, about their workforce needs, um, what challenges might they be having with regard to training and development, recruitment and retention, um, which can inform how we partner with some of our workforce and education partners. What are some of their business operations? Um, are they seeing revenue go up or down? What are they looking at with regard to export? What kind of um, assistance might they need? What are they planning for in terms of their site and facility growth? Are they looking at expansion? Are there things that we need to do to support that? Does their existing facility, can it accommodate that? Um, what type of questions or increasing needs are they gonna have with regard to utilities and how can we support that? And then really overall, what is the business climate? So what are the advantages and disadvantages of doing business in Longmont? What are those things that maybe we wanna get in front of and help um, if we're identifying an issue? Um, so just to give you a quick um, glimpse, some of you saw um, a more in-depth presentation of this at our economic summit in February, but we always ask what are the advantages and disadvantages of doing business. So here you see the advantage. The, the top advantage for doing business, which I don't think surprises any of us, is Longmont has an incredible quality of life. This is something that always is strong and was really strong in uh, 2023 with about 80% of people identifying that. Obviously amenities, um, cost of doing business, and access to customers. When we look at the disadvantages, um, probably not surprising, availability of housing, cost of living, access to labor. These have been things that have been identified for the past several years and have really informed the work that my organization as well as our partners and obviously the city have been focused on. Um, so we'll get a chance to see how people are responding in 2024. If you are a primary employer or if you're talking with primary employers, we would love to have them complete this survey um, and that will be open for about the next month or so. And I'm happy to provide some links. Um, I'll quickly close with just some general data. Um, we are happy to provide economic and housing data to the city. I know you guys have a really robust um, data program. Um, but here's some information on economic indicators. I'm not going to necessarily go through all this, but the, the takeaway message here is employment is still um, strong. We have high labor force participation, relatively low unemployment, and I think that's what we're seeing when we um, have companies tell us they still have access to or challenges with access to talent. Um, and so those are some things that we keep watching. 
When we look at um, residential real estate, our partners at Bolo Realtors provide this data to us monthly. Again, I know you spend a lot of time talking about housing, so I won't go into detail. Um, you can see the median price in Longmont is, is sitting at about 630,000. We haven't seen that fluctuate a ton in the data that we've seen. I will say it was interesting when we look at this data from April, we have seen the number of homes sold as well as the inventory increase kind of across the board. So that may be due to time of year. Um, obviously, some of you probably have some thoughts on that, um, but it maybe is a good sign that there's um, some more movement in the housing market. And then finally, um, looking at non-residential real estate, um, for the first quarter, this information comes from CoStar. We can provide some more detailed reports if council is interested. Um, the takeaway here, A, is that this is not vacant square footage. I noticed that um, after I had sent this presentation to Don, but didn't want to um, make a stink. So this is our total space in industrial and office um, when you see that third bullet. Um, we have seen that... Um, our industrial space, we do have quite a bit of vacant industrial space. And some of that is concentrated at some pretty large campuses, the MAX Innovation at Boulder County. Um, I think that's actually a really great opportunity for us because those have power, they have water, they have parking, um, they have some pretty great spaces that, that um, property owners are investing in. And I think that gives us an opportunity to attract companies. Those are some of these large projects are located within chip zones or enterprise zones. So um, we look at that as a real opportunity. I will note that we're seeing rents go up a couple percent, um, two percent in industrial and about um, one percent in office over the last year. Um, and office vacancy has decreased slightly. So with that, I will close and take any questions that council might have. Council have any questions? Um, no. Council Member Martin, no. Um, you know, actually, I do have um, one um, question, and it was in regard to the survey that had listed access to skilled labor as one of in the top three of a dis disadvantage. Um, you know, in, in looking at how many businesses in Longmont are open to apprenticeship and working with youth and, and building that capacity in, in certain industry. Um, you know, has, do, you, do you get a high um, interest in having businesses take in apprentice and interns? I think there does um, continue to be interest in internships and apprenticeships, and certainly we are very fortunate to have our partners at the St. Vrain Valley School mm -hmm. District who have, obviously, as you know, yeah. um, have some pretty, pretty innovative models to look at how do we prepare the students of today for the jobs of tomorrow. Um, I think there does continue to be some challenges, particularly with high school students and age requirements in some of the advanced manufacturing work. Um, there are a lot of conversations through um, our regional economic development partners or sector partnerships and with our partners at St. Vrain and Front Range, Front Range yeah. um, about how do we continue to expand internships and how do we stand up apprenticeships. So there's some really innovative programs. Um, some of the things that we've been talking about is are there ways we can kind of model an intern and apprentice program for adults in the community and what might that look like and how could we um, train and upskill folks that are already here to take advantage of these jobs. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of focus throughout the state and some really exciting funding that's coming to Colorado um, through the Colorado Wyoming Engine and some other different programs that are really going to be focused on internships, apprenticeships, work-based learning, and training local folks um, for jobs in, um, you know, climate and green tech, aerospace. And so I think figuring out how we continue to support that and plug that in. But yes, the lo really long-winded answer to your question yeah. is there's a lot of interest in internships and apprenticeships yeah. and just figuring out how to scale that. How, how to scale that. Yeah. And, yeah, and how to how to navigate that. You know, at, at last spring when I was at um, National League of Cities, there was, you know, I'd hear from different departments saying that there's a lot of grant opportunities yeah. for folks who do tie in that apprenticeship into their, into their scope and goals. So I, uh, you know, I know that there's money out there that we can yeah. tap into to support that. And St. Vrain was the recipient, this was a little yeah. bit before my time, mm -hmm. but they were the recipient, I think of maybe still the largest opportunity now grant Mm -hmm. um, that's really going to stand up kind of an apprenticeship center and focus on 
keeping kids through, um, you know, not, not ending them at their senior year, but kind of being able to continue that support. And so I think that'll be an incredible partnership with opportunity with industry. Oh, that sounds great. Thank you. And then I see um, Council Member McCoy. Um, Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, Hidalgo Farron. Uh, Ms. Fosslick, I'm I'm very pleased to hear this and to kind of piggyback on what uh, uh, Mayor Pertem is talking about in regards to internships as a high school teacher and a career and technical teacher. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of my students will return a year later. They're, they're freshmen going on sophomores or sophomores going on juniors in college. It, is there any way that we can create a, some sort of clearinghouse, uh, some sort of connection there so that when they're leaving school, their teachers can kind of say to them, hey, you know, if you reach out to the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Economic Development Authority here uh, and uh, work with them on on this, you might be able to get some of those because many of them are coming home. They're coming home to, to, uh, to cut the costs of uh, uh, being away at school and to, to, uh, to have that family support uh, during the summers. So that, that's, you know, kind of a critical time. And so I hear them, you know, I've had many students return and they're doing an internship with uh, different uh, groups like uh, Northwest Mutual mm-hmm. and others like that if they're going into like a business degree or some sort of thing like that. So is that something that we can try to get working? Because if we are really trying to establish, you know, we've got people that are already ingrained and, and uh, see this community as a great community. They were happy to graduate from the high schools. They were happy to participate as students here and their families have made this home. So, you know, and thinking of, you know, my own children, the the fact how nice it is to have them close by Mm -hmm. you know we are trying as parents say hey this is a pretty great community to live in and uh, we'd like to somehow figure out some way of you coming in here and being able to work here when you're done with your career uh, you know you know developing your career at college or wherever and so that's something that I'd like to see if we somehow could do because if we're really serious about creating this it's not that, but then I'm also worried. I always get a little worried about uh, internships, making sure that businesses understand what an internship really is. It's not just getting coffee, uh, that sort of thing, because some just simply do not understand that. That's not uh, uh, that sort of thing. It's really important that they are getting some sort of learning. Otherwise, it's just kind of slave labor uh, and uh, in the worst sort of way. And so we really need to focus on on what that is when we do a clearinghouse, we need to make sure that the businesses that are taking on people understand how serious it is when they do take an intern on and that it is uh, something more meaningful to them. Yeah, I think those are great points and I think it's worth a follow-up conversation Mm -hmm. with um, Dr. Haddad and the school district. Um, you know, they've done a really incredible job with, again, as, as you both know, the P-TECH programs and really having those industry partners and being very deliberate about the types of internships that they set up. So it is that um, entree into work, um, you know, and, and having that be meaningful. I do think that the work they're going to stand up with the Opportunity Now grant is essentially going to do what you're um, talking about. That was just that was a grant that was a little before my time, so I can't speak eloquently to that, but I'd be happy to get that information and provide it to Harold and then he can share it with you. Because I think the intent is that, you know, you don't graduate and then you're out of the system. It's yeah. that continued um, kind of cultivation of the, the student and their skill set and that internship and being able to provide that bridge until maybe it becomes, you know, instead of an internship or apprenticeship, you've now been hired full time. So yeah, I'll, I'll try to collect some more information on that and get it over to you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh-huh. Okay. So um, next on our agenda, we'll be hearing from Visit Longmont um, staff. Or this, whichever you prefer. There you go. Thank you. Yes. 
Good evening, Mayor Pro Temp and City Council members. My name is Sarah Leonard. I'm the CEO of Visit Longmont. And I just want to note that it was almost a year ago today that I first uh, introduced myself to you all and moved to Longmont, almost a year to the date. But tonight, I'm here to share with you a mid-year report on Visit Longmont activities. I'll highlight our city contract deliverables, which are captured in three major buckets, community and visitor engagement, visitor profiles and economic impact, and marketing and branding, which is core to our mission. I'll start with our continued assessment of how we deliver visitor information here in Longmont. I want to spend a little bit more time in future slides on economic data that we've recently invested in, as that information informs all of our planning and marketing. But first, we are continually researching potential new stations for visitor information sites, sites based on research showing us visitor and resident ratios through geolo geolocation data. For example, we have brainstormed mobile visitor centers using a retrofitted vehicle that could get information to those visitors where they are at once they arrive in Longmont, along with permanently placed selfie stations or visitor center stanchions in places like Village of the Peaks, McIntosh Lake, and the airport potentially, all places that we see visitors are going to through this geolocation data. Also in February and March, Visit Longmont hosted two listening sessions with tourism businesses, sp specifically focused on our hotel partners. The listening sessions explored a tourism improvement district, district as a new sustainable funding model. After receiving generally positive feedback from hotel partners, the Visit Longmont Board of Directors approved continuing the discussion and investing in this next six-month phase of a potential TID formation. You'll be hearing more about that in the next couple of months. Oops. And we continually monitor visitor and resident sentiment through our social media engagement organically. We also added a couple of questions about visitor satisfaction included in this most recent study that we just concluded, which I will talk about next. And finally, through the community poll, we have a final design for Monty, the Long Monster mascot, which we are in production right now of producing that mascot, literally as we speak. There's a little graphic of Monty. So now on, on to the research. When I first met you a, a year ago, I said I hope to invest in research so that I can come back to you and report some highlights on economic data and some visitor profile information. So we partnered with a con research consulting group called Future Partners to complete an econ just that, an economic analysis and visitor profile study for the calendar year 2023. It included a visitor profile study and economic impact capturing this information on the slide from travel motivations to booking windows to numbers of visitors and spending data. Future Partners gathered key data points through three sources, an online survey of Longmont visitors that year, we distributed that same survey to our owned audiences. These were Visit Longmont email contacts and mobile geolocation data analysis. This data was used as inputs into their custom economic model using their in-plan. And the goal was to target a sample size of 400 visitors. We reached 351 survey respondents. And here are some of the highlights we learned about visitors to Longmont that year. In 2023, nearly 600,000 visitors traveled to Longmont. They infused over $205 million into the city through direct spending. Visitors contributed overall indirect, induced, and direct spending $277 million for total economic impact for Longmont. And 3,000 plus jobs are supported by the tourism industry in our community. Visitors lean, we, we found out also information about our visitors to Longmont. So visitors lean slightly female with an average age of 49. They're married or have a partner. The majority have a graduate or higher degree and are currently employed with an average income of just under 100,000. What I thought was a really compelling data point is that $7,000, I'm sorry, in the absence of the tourism industry, every household in Longmont would need to spend an extra $7,000 to keep the local economy operating at the current level. 
Tourism supported a wide variety of local businesses, especially those associated with, with food and drink, our, our local restaurants and eateries. As they accounted for the largest share of visitor spending, you can see t about almost 30%, and then the other, the next largest spending category was accommodations at 20%, and here were the other sectors of uh, local businesses that contributed that to that $205 million economic impact. We also know that Longmont delivers on our visitor experience. 96% of our visitors say they were satisfied with their overall experience on their last trip to Longmont. When we asked how well Longmont delivers on a set of attributes, we had a whole list of questions around attractions and experiences in the survey. Visitors considered family-friendly experiences, park access, and outdoor recreation as top activities. These are also the top reasons or motivators visitors are traveling to Longmont. Through other responses, we know there are opp opportunities to enhance the visitor experience around accessibility, the art scene, and historic and cultural sites. My last couple of slides uh, focus on our current marketing and branding efforts, which include media in market, a new look for Visit Longmont, targeted e-newsletters, we're updating our official visitor guide, and reimagining visitlongmont.org, which is our main traveler and consumer website. So this year, we are investing $100,000 in digital and social media alone. We started in May with Google ads and social content, and then we're going to ramp up in the beginning of July and through the end of this year. Our media plan consists of display banners through digital display banners through a platform called Edu Edgenuity. We're also um, placing native banner ads and retargeting um, messaging and doing sponsored articles on Colorado.com. That's the state's main traveler consumer website. So there are visitors already with an affinity towards choosing Colorado for their vacation. So we'll be leveraging that connection through colorado.com. E-Target Media is a platform that provides custom email list targeting to our top markets. And we we know from the visitor research that our top in-state markets are Denver, Colorado Springs, and then an outside city market of Chicago. We're doing Google text ads and Facebook and Instagram we manage, um, posting images, videos, and carousels. We also continue to provide monthly newsletters to potential traveler contacts of our over 35,000 email database that Longmont manages. Those are from visitors who sign up for the visitor guide, which is in hard copy, which you've probably seen, and also digitally. We also launched a new e-newsletter targeted to the business community called In the Know. And this inaugural newsletter received a 55% open rate, which is pretty good for a first newsletter to an email list of over 325 business contacts in the Longmont community, and this, uh, this newsletter sign-up list continues to grow. I mentioned we're updating our official visitor guide, and we're still distributing last year's guide, but our big effort this year is reimagining visitlongmont.org, which we began at the beginning of the year. It's a compre really a comprehensive effort, including and a content audit, which we've completed with our agency, stakeholder feedback, updated designs, a whole new look and feel, all with the goal of launching before the end of this year. We obviously continue to watch closely Longmont's Lodgers Tax, which is uh, behind year over year through April. And although the margins are getting closer each month as we get that information from the city, the years um, after the pandemic were such boost years. I, I see that nationally in meetings and from my national colleagues that people really were craving vacations and traveling a lot after the pandemic ended. I think that this year what we're seeing is sort of getting back to normal levels. Um, we're also seeing more US travelers choosing to visit international destinations as those places up, open up more and more. And these external, these big external factors, they do trickle down to small destinations in communities like ours in Longmont. Hopefully we will flatten out or maybe even end up stronger this December with some of the marketing we're doing and partnering with our hotel partners. 
Then looking ahead, we will continue our social and digital media through the year. We have several new efforts that I've mentioned that we will complete this year, including we're gathering new images, uh, image assets and video from working in partnership with local photographers. Actually, this next week, we're updating our visitor guide. We'll have Monty, the long monster mascot, and we're reimagining our website. So I those are the highlights. I want to thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions. And my only ask for you is I have um, some new Longmont ball caps to give to you to wear and help us promote Longmont and be advocates for travel to our community. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions from council? OK, no. Well, thank you very much. That was great. Say there, there is no public invited here. <laughs> no one signed up. So, thank you. Okay, so we are now at the public invited to be heard. The first person on the list is Dan Wolford. Um, yep. So, and the next person, if you want to get ready, Lance Whitaker. Um, so you have three minutes. Please state your name and address before you begin speaking. Mayor Pro Tem, council members, my name is Dan Wolford. I live at 1815 3rd Avenue in Longmont. I'm actually quite excited tonight to be here. The reason being is nearly a quarter of a century ago, I stood in this exact spot in front of Mayor Leona Stacker and the likes of Councilman McCoy's father, Tom McCoy. I was on the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, member coming to council requesting council support to place an open space sales tax <clears throat> on the November 2000 ballot. With the leadership and, and the support from that, that council, the open space sales tax passed in November of 2000. It was for two tenths of a percent or two cents on every $10 <clears throat> in November and therefore the open space program itself started on January 1 of 2001. Without council's leadership and support, as well as subsequent um, councils, the city wouldn't have such wondrous open space properties. Daniel Cassidy will present many of those properties tonight to you later on in the open space updates. But some of those wondrous places include Lake McIntosh, Dickens Farm Park. I think you've heard both of those names already tonight and the economic updates and some of that kind of stuff. The diverse and unique riparian and wildlife habitat along the St. Vrain and the areas of Sandstone Ranch and many, many more. But today, I'm here to represent a different group, that of the Stand With Our St. Vrain. And as many of you are aware, um, we've been working diligently for probably over the past year to collect a variety of signatures from citizens, um, and members throughout the community who support the permanent extension of the open space sales tax. We've worked dil diligently at a variety of events throughout the city, including Rhythm on the River, Pride Fest, Art Walk, Earth Day celebration, and even re most recently, the Children's Water Festival at Dickens Farm Park. Again, the community supports this process as we've collected, like I said, I believe, over a thousand or nearly a thousand resident signatures. So we would ask that, you know, this um, November, the open space sales tax extension to be permanent, to be on, on the ballot. A critical factor for this in the success is the fact that this is not a new tax. It's an existing tax that's gone on since 2001. Stand with our St. Vrain is in the process of soliciting letters also of support from your advisory boards, including the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, which met last night and unanimously supported this. We'll be talking to the Sustainability Advisory Board, the Water Board, and Transportation Board. Council should be very pleased 
for the success in Thank all you. these things. And I will say that we will be back in two weeks. Thank you. Yep, we'll see you then. That <laughs> when we have a full council. Yes. And you Thank do you. have brochures. I do have yes. that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So next on the list is Lance Whitaker. And, um, and then Mike Sandoval after. Well, hello, Mayor Pro Term. <laughs> My name is Lance Whitaker. I live at 1750 Collier Street, Longmont, Colorado. I've been a resident for a whole 44 years. Um, I know what he was talking about. We did approve that. And we definitely got a nice skate park out of it at Sandstone Ranch. And I would like to thank you for your help on that. Um, Aaron was also right in pointing out that our industrial area is a ghost town compared to what I was used to in 2000. Just looking back at my resume from back then, we had hundreds. Now we're down to four, I believe, in the industrial area. So yeah, the area has become a very big ghost town for our industrial. Um, back to my main business. Today is National Forklift Safety Day, National Call Your Doctor Day. I probably should do that. Um, National Making Life Beautiful Day. I'm pretty good at that one. National German Chocolate Cake Day. Any cake day is good cake day to me. National Corn on the Cob Day, and don't tell anyone, but tomorrow is National Red Rose, and Colette will be getting one. Thank you. You all have a good day. Thank you. Okay, um, next, Mike Sandoval. And then Stephen Allshuler after. Hello, City Council. Uh, Mike Sandoval, 242 East Mountain View. Uh, I grew up here in Longmont. Um, I'm just talking about the seniors talk tonight. So I wanted to talk about some of the people I know here in Longmont and some of their lives. Um, right now, the seniors, I guess, um, the Social Security is around, um, in increase is around 2 or 3%, OK? So I talked to my VA veteran buddy, and um, he's living in um, housing here, senior housing here in Longmont. Um, his rent isn't real high, but however, they're going to have meetings in the next couple months, and the rent's going to increase. And I'm like, why is the rent increasing? Well, one's mill levy is going up 19% to drop from 20 to 19%. So they're bragging about a 1% decrease, okay? Property taxes are up 35%. I talked to the assessor here in Longmont, and he says uh, he has a two-bedroom or a three-bedroom house, and his rent's going, no, no, his mortgage is going up $300 a month. So I'm looking at my uh, VA, some people I know who are seniors, and um, they have dental, a lot of health care issues. Uh, one is dental. One of them has to replace their teeth. Dental insurance isn't really good. So they're replacing two implants on their teeth. they got to spend $5,000. Talk to another person, they want to replace all their teeth. That's $30,000, okay? Well, if they only have <laughs> Social Security, um, I mean, there's some people who have homes and they could sell them and they can't afford to pay things off, but others cannot. And we heard some of the senior center tonight to uh, talk about that. Um, so what I'm looking at, um, Jerome Powell, the federal chairman, said he only wants inflation at 2% at a national level. So then why are mill levies up 19%? They should be 2% for seniors. Uh, property taxes up 35%. They should only be up 2% for seniors. Or cancel all property taxes and mill levies for seniors so they can use their funds to pay health care costs and survive instead of being at risk of being homeless. Thank you. Stephen Allshuler. 
And the next one on the list is Feroz Gerard. But are you wanting to speak? <laughs> I, I got it. <laughs> um, are you wanting to speak during public hearing? You're speaking on item 10A. So you can either wait or you can come after. Something to think about. You have three minutes. <laughs> OK, go ahead. That assumes I take all my time. Yeah. Steve Altshuler, 1555 Taylor Drive. Um, I would like to agree with a lot of what the man just said. I think it was Mike. You know, just looking at property taxes alone, if they went up 35%, I've got a couple of rental properties, and that means I have to raise everyone's rent about $100 a month. And that's not in counting, counting insurance and utilities and other things. So the expenses for renters are going up a lot. And I just want to point out, it's not necessarily the landlord's fault. So a lot of city councils and a lot of people all around tend to take the assumption that landlords are being greedy. But with property taxes and, like I said, utilities and everything else, our costs are going up and we have to pass it through. Anyhow, a um, lady was talking about the uh, chip manufacturers. And I wanted to point out that the people that would move here to work at places like Micron and other high-tech industries, they have no interest in moving here to live in high-density, low-income apartments, which is 90 to 100% of what city council seems to want to build. So if you want to develop that part of the industry for Longmont, you need to realize that they're going to want to live in homes. And they're not going to want to live in 15 to 50-year-old homes. They're going to want to live in newer, high-tech homes they're going to have yards for their kids to grow up and play in. And I just think the council needs to think about that and not cut off your nose to spite your face just because you have so much of a desire for low-income housing. Um, last month at a coffee to council, Marsha Martin stated that she doesn't see any single-family housing tracks ever being approved again in Longmont. So there is a conflict, and I think you need to be aware of that before you low-income construct yourself into a corner. And that's it, not even my whole three minutes. Thank you, have a nice evening. Thanks. Did you want to speak now? Okay. Um, before I go, i just like to separate the issues. Uh, I was just, I'd like to also speak when, uh, on 10A when it comes to the hearing. Oh, sure, but sure. But i like to separate two, uh, two Got things. Got it. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi. Oh. You may begin. Uh, thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Faraz Gerard. I live off uh, North 75th Street in Western Longmont, Colorado. And I just want to bring up a great point that Mr. Brenna brought up. I believe it would be a great idea to put closed captioning on, uh, the, spe on the screens um, simply because uh, uh, if somebody requests, if I'm not mistaken, and you don't provide it, and I could be wrong, but I fear that you'd be in violation of the American Disabilities Act of 1990. So please make considerations uh, for this. And also, it's just the right thing to do, not to, along with providing for the, our elderly, our, our older mm -hmm. community, those that are disabled and uh, the need assistance with hearing and um, visual aids. Um, I think it would be, yeah, a great idea. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. So um, there's seen no one else on the list. I will close public invited to be heard. And so now we are on um, number nine of our um, agenda, the consent agenda and introduction and reading by title of first reading ordinances. Um, so Don, can you please read the consent agenda into the record? Absolutely. Uh, the second reading and public hearing for the ordinances introduced on this agenda will be held on June 25th, 2024. Item 9A is ordinance 2024-42. A bill for an ordinance amending Chapter 11.16 of the Longmont Municipal Code concerning incorrect model traffic code references, discrepancies with appeal and review deadlines, and timed parking enforcement. 
9B is resolution 2024-34, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving amendment number one to the intergovernmental agreement between the city of Longmont and the Colorado Department of Human Services Office of Behavioral Health for original contract number 24 IBEH 183792 for funding an upgraded database for Longmont Public Safety's lead and core programs through the Criminal Justice Early Intervention Grant SB 196. 9C is resolution 2024-35, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the revocable permit and agreement between the city and LRC Raceway for remote control vehicle racing opportunities at Union Reservoir. 9D is resolution 2024-36, a resolution of the Longmont City Council modifying R99-18 concerning the Longmont Youth Council. 9E is resolution 2024-37, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the agreement between the city and the AR Group LLC for Code of Ethics and Hearing Officer Special Counsel Services. 9F is Resolution 2024-38, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the agreement between the city and Matthew Sura LLC for Energy, Environment, and Carbon Management Special Counsel Services. 9G is approved Longmont Youth Council appointments, and 9H is approved the 2024-2025 Water Supply and Water Shortage Implementation Plan. Okay, um, thank you. Is there anyone who wants to pull an item? Okay, um, so may I please have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Okay, Second. Okay. so the um, uh, Council Member McCoy made a motion to approve the consent agenda, uh, seconded by Council Member Christ. Any discussion? Let's go ahead and vote. Just not seeing Councilmember Martin's vote, Mayor Pro Tem, if she could. Um, just Council Member Martin, could you give a voice verbally. vote? Mm -hmm. um, or a thumbs up? <laughs> uh, you're on mute. So, uh, Council Member Martin, we can't hear you. Can you give me a thumbs up if you approve? Awesome. Okay. So. <laughs> The motion um, carries unanimously with uh, Mayor Peck out. Okay, so now we are moving on to, oh, here we go, ah, item 10. <laughs> so ordinances on second reading and public hearings on any matter. Um, so, and. This is for Ordinance 2024-40, a bill for an ordinance establishing a charge of $1.25 for month, per month for emergency telephone service, 911, for wired, wireless, or VOIP, voice over internet protocol subscribers in Longmont for the calendar year of 2025. Um, do we have anyone speaking to this? Um, Nope. Okay, are there any questions from council before I open the public hearing? Okay, so um, so now I will now open the public hearing on um, Ordinance 2024-40. So, so okay. uh, Let me reset that and you'll have three minutes to speak. Oh, cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, good evening again. This is me again, Froster R. Uh, from... Uh, North 75th Street out in Western Longmont, Colorado. And on Ordinance 2024-40, um, I would like to ask uh, why. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, forgive my ignorance, but to my untrained eyes, this looks like an additional tax of some sort. I apologize I didn't do my due diligence and read on it. I just got notice of this today of the agenda. Um, is there something wrong with our budgeting for uh, um, uh, Longmont public safety? Uh, is there an increase? Uh, I, I understand we want to support our first responders, police and firefighters, but again, this is seems like a tax. And I know a few weeks ago, uh, the mayor talked about you know how we want to govern, you know. Um, with impartiality, meaning with fairness, but this just not, this doesn't sit right with me. So I would like to think the fair thing to do is if somebody could briefly explain to me 
um, what the dollar twenty five cents a month for nine one one calls on these uh, pro different types of services um, is going to go towards just so we can get clarification. Um, okay. Thank you. So um, I'm going to go ahead and call our public safety chief or someone to speak to that. They can articulate it a lot better than I could. Oh, thank um, you. But yeah, we'll have, yeah. He's coming down. Uh, cool. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem, Council Member Zach Hart is Public Safety Chief for the City of Longmont. If you recall, we came back to you in March and discussed uh, Bretta, which is the Boulder Regional uh, basically telephone authority that manages the 911 fee that you pay both for your cell phone and your landline. Uh, it's not a tax, it's a fee that's already included. Uh, Bretta already collects those funds, or the state actually does. Um, right now, the fee is 75 cents. For Boulder County, it's going up to $1.25. There hasn't been a rate increase for the fee, I think, since 2014. And so as we discussed, this really is to help cover the cost of operating the 9-1 centers. And what it does not do is does not require tax dollars to be used versus the state dollars that are paid to Bretza to be funded for the different um, dispatch centers. So, but I'm happy to talk to that gentleman a little bit more and run through a little more details with him. Uh, but just wanted to refresh council's memory um, about what it was and why the increase was needed. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, so I'm gonna go ahead, if, is there anyone else w wanting to speak on this item? So I will now close public hearing. May I have a motion to pass and adopt ordinance 2024-40? I move that uh, 2024-40. Second. Okay. Okay, so um, we had a, um, a motion from Council Member McCoy and seconded by Council Member Yarborough. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and vote. Okay, so the motion ca uh, carries unanimously, um, minus Mayor Peck. Um, we are now on the next um, item on second reading, and it is um, Ordinance 2024-41, a bill for an ordinance amending Section 14.04.330 uh, of the uh, Longmont Municipal Code regarding temporary water permits for cons uh, construction water. So are there any questions from Council? Okay, is there any presentation? For this, no. Okay, so um, I'm going to go ahead and open up the public hearing. Is there anyone who would like to speak on Ordinance 2024-41? Okay. So seeing no one wanting to speak, I will now close public hearing. May I have a motion to pass and adopt Ordinance 2024-41? I move Ordinance 2024-41. Second. Okay, so that uh, motion was, um, there was a motion by Council Member Rodriguez, seconded by Council Member McCoy. Uh, let's go ahead and vote. Okay, so the motion carries unanimously um, with Mayor Peck absent. And so now we are going to general business. Uh, and this is the biannual customer service satisf uh, customer satisfaction survey, and we have a staff presentation by Becky Doyle. I'll hang out over here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and members of council. I'm Becky Doyle, Executive Director of Strategic Integration. I am joined by our uh, uh, Data and Analytics Manager, Lynn Yarmy, and uh, also our Data and Innovation Analyst over my right shoulder here, Anna Castro, who have been working hard on getting our 2024 uh, Customer Satisfaction Survey out to customers. Uh, we don't have a formal presentation. We just wanted to let you know that we are going about this survey in a new way. 
um, which is actually really exciting for sort of our whole program of how we receive feedback from the community. Um, rather than having a, a firm um, come in and, and do that, that survey as we traditionally have in the past, we've invested in some software that's going to help us be able to um, listen to the community across platforms and um, opportunities throughout the year. You know, we can do ad hoc surveys. Uh, we can combine information from, you know, web uh, <laughs> web surveys as as we've been uh, accustomed to seeing on on web pages, from engagements that we have, from phone calls that we take, and from these larger um, re- research based surveys that that we do with the community. So we're really excited to partner with Qualtrics is the name of the uh, the software that we're implementing to make that change. Um, and we, we think that it will be uh, also more accessible to the community. Um, we'll be doing a little bit of, of monitoring as we roll this survey out this year to, uh, to see if we're, if we're ready to go kind of digital first, maybe next time. Uh, this time we are going to be mailing uh, the, the survey out to a, um, a randomly selected sample, really similar to the way that, that we have done that in the past. So we're here to answer questions that you have about how the survey will be conducted this year, as well as to solicit um, any thoughts that you have for a small number, maybe two or three of policy questions that we often include in this survey. So any thoughts or questions, we're, we're here for you. Does anyone have any questions? Um, Council Member Rodriguez. So with this new contract with Qualtrics, will that stop some of the emails that city council gets from Qualtrics? Because they're, they're incessant. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's true. I will look into that for you. <laughs> Great question. <laughs> okay, so seeing no one else, um, thank you very much. That was a very quick presentation. <laughs> I, you know, actually, I do have a question. If there's something that we as council want to submit to you, when, when would be the drop dead deadline? If we could discuss kind of the general topics now and refine the questions over the next okay. couple of days, we would okay. very much like to have the survey mailed out in the first week or so of July. Um, so we may not have an opportunity to come okay. back to a council meeting to, to complete so. that. So. If, so if, last call for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Just throwing it out there. Um, go ahead, Council Member McCoy. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Hidalgo Faring. Uh, Becky, I, I, I don't really have a question, but it, when we start talking about adding questions to this, I think they we really need to look about uh, look a little deeper about what we're really asking and how and uh, if if we're gonna uh, add questions, I think it should come probably in the next week or uh, by by Friday or Monday or something like that, but then we're not going to have a chance as a council to discuss it. So, we can wait a week. Yeah. What, what we can do is if council can submit the questions, then what we will do is look at the next. So next week is housing authority. I think the week after that is a council meeting, and we can bring those questions that council submit or one of the questions you all want us to look at because you all will have to as a body mm -hmm. decide what mm -hmm. questions you want to include yeah. mm -hmm. um, and also I think we want to be a little bit mindful on length so when we've done this yeah. before we've we've talked about how many questions we're going to add yeah. mm -hmm. um, surveys fatigue is, is, mm -hmm. big, yeah. but is my point um, so if, if there's questions that council is interested in us asking if we can get those to Becky um, as soon as possible, that way we can get an agenda item for the next council meeting, then I think that'll only delay us, what, a week and a half, maybe? Thank you. If we don't see something by that, like, say, a drop-dead date of Monday or something like that or Tuesday, uh, can she proceed without that? Correct. Is that something that we can all agree to? I mean, if council's content with us, if we receive no questions, we'll proceed, then that's the approach we can take. Mm -hmm. What I will say for those of you all new to the council that haven't seen this, there are a host of questions mm -hmm. that we ask that we have consistently asked from the beginning of the survey. And so that's really 
what we're monitoring on and it looks at everything from trash service to library service and and so mm -hmm. there will be consistent questions that we're moving through because that's what we're assessing yeah I, it takes some analysis to really put that in there so it's not you're not getting redundancies or or the the survey fatigue that is there so, the, well thank you i appreciate that here's the other option with this that becky mentioned is before we tended to be limited especially from a scientific survey and the, you know a random sample size we were historically limited as to when we could do that because we were reliant on the outside contractor to do that the that's what we were so intrigued about with qualtrics is we no longer have that limitation so if there's things you know let's say we're moving down the road and council goes we want to see what a kind of random truly random survey looks like on this issue we can do that and we can do that internally and that's part of our strategic integration department and what we're doing so also i would say don't feel rushed if you if you have questions because there will be opportunities throughout the year for us to come back and potentially do a more fo focused survey and at some at some point we can do some stuff digitally and yeah. things like that so that's that sure sure improves things and when you're you get that in t in real time response in terms of data based decision making this is probably the most significant change that we've seen in quite some time thank you council member christ Becky, is this the survey that's going to go out? It is. It is based on the, the surveys that we've done historically, so we're, we're keeping that trend data. We'll be able to adjust more of the survey as we move forward in future years. Okay. I just have one correction for you. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, if you could also send that via email so we're sure that we get that, that correct. That would be yeah. great. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then I'm just going to say our, our top items that are on our priorities here are things that maybe we should consider asking some focused questions about you know transportation housing uh, that we think might be useful okay very good thank you So um, the next side, so I don't, we're good. You're good to go. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so the next item on the agenda is the Longmont, presentation of the Longmont Open Spaces, an overview of our past, present, and future. Come on down. How about now? Yes. Good evening, council members. I'm Danielle Cassidy. I'm the open space manager for the city of Longmont in the Department of Parks and Natural Resources. Also with me tonight is Jim Crick, who is our ecosystem management manager. So he, he and his staff also work on open spaces. They're out in the field doing the operations and maintenance. They're the natural resource technicians, wildlife biologists, plant ecologists. Um, so I have a informational presentation for you tonight about open space. Um, per Susie Hildago Faring's request, I believe back in January or February, mm -hmm. we're finally here. So um, I'm excited to let you know about open space. So I can't do a presentation about our city's open space without our land acknowledgement starting off the presentation. Um, this is the only slide I'm going to read to you in full tonight. We acknowledge that Longmont sits on the traditional territory of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, and other indigenous peoples. We honor the history and the living and spiritual connection that the first peoples have with this land. 
It is our commitment to face the injustices that happen when the land was taken and to educate our communities, ourselves, and our children to ensure that these injustices do not happen. So this is, this is part of our past when we talk about the past of open space. This is where we start. Um, and why is open space important to us today? Uh, these lands preserve um, quality of life and promote conservation and stewardship. And I'll get into much more detail. Um, this is our Golden Ponds nature area here pictured. So this is the, or, the open space ordinance from our municipal code and it gets a little further into all the things that the open space program is, um, it, it is our job to do. Preser preservation of natural areas, wildlife habitat and visual corridors, agricultural, um, preservation of trails, streams, and open space, conservation of natural resources, um, greenways and open space policies, policies and strategies, and urban shaping buffers. So in the past, um, and you heard a little bit of this from Dan Wolford in the public invited to be heard, um, our Longmont open space sales and use tax passed for the first time in 2000. We're a relatively young open space program um, as far as programs around the Front Range. We're here in Boulder County and they've got their open space program which is 50 years old. We've got the city of Boulder nearby and uh, their first open space tax passed in 1967. So um, ours was approved, um, our tax was first approved in the year 2000 and dedicated in uh, 2001 for acquisitions and multimodal transportation connectivity. So um, regional trails are, are part of our open space program. The program, Longmont's program began in 2002. So we're just past 20 years old at this point. Um, the first things we did as a program in that year were uh, write our open space and trails master plan and we purchased our very first open space pictured here. This is Boulder Creek Estates. It's a 218 acre property. It, it encompasses the confluence of St. Vrain and Boulder Creeks. And we had no idea at the time that now 20 years later, it would be an essential piece of helping us complete the eastern phase of our St. Vrain Greenway Trail, phase 13, which will connect sandstone ranched into St. Vrain State Park and continue east from there. In 2007, voters uh, approved uh, renewing the open space tax, and so that's what we currently find ourselves under. Um, that is set to sunset in 2034. So like I'm saying, the open space program is still young, um, but the Longmont community has consistently identified parks, trails, and open space lands as highly valued. Uh, we heard it in the um, economic report from Erin Fosdick and her colleague earlier that uh, many of our visitors, I believe they said 79% come here for the um, outdoor opportunities. Um, I think I saw Lake McIntosh pictured in one of their slides, and that's one of our open space nature areas. Um, also, the open space program aligns with five of seven um, council priorities, and I'll, I'll uh, point these out later in the presentation, um, and here they are. So now I'm, uh, a series of maps to really illustrate open space for you. Um, here you'll see Longmont, and the yellow line is the Longmont planning area, um, and so inside the Longmont planning area, you'll see the green are parks, which are not open spaces, as well as nature areas. So Dickens Farm nature area, uh, McIntosh Lake nature area. Um, these are open spaces within the Longmont planning area, but as you can see, they're um, relatively small. But then when you get outside the Longmont planning area, this is where we uh, purchase our bigger open spaces. So the map starts to fill in outside the Longmont planning area. The dark green is uh, City of Longmont's open spaces. You can see them mostly on the east side of the map. And that sort of lime green is Boulder County's open spaces. And then when you layer on 
conservation easements, which is another um, protection mechanism for agricultural properties and, and um, open spaces. You see the map fill in a little bit more. And then finally, if you layer on other public lands, you can see Birch Lake lands filling in around McIntosh Lake. Those are other city properties, so those are owned by other funds. So mm -hmm. although they have open space values, um, they are not technically open spaces. They're other uh, city lands because they are funded by other departments, sanitation, um, water, etc. So now into some of the beef of um, what open space funding supports and what the open space um, and the ecosystem management work groups do. Uh, we do a lot of planning, um, management plans, management plan updates, uh, and uh, CIP and long-term planning. Um, and then in terms of acquisitions, we have been acquiring open space since the inception of our program in 2002. I told you about our first purchase, Boulder Creek Estates. Um, we never set a goal in the beginning uh, when we wrote our open space and trails master plan and when we wrote our open space management plan to say, we have a goal of buying X acres of open space and then we're going to be done. We never set that goal. But if we wanted to take a look and think about the maps that we just saw and say, where are we? Are, are we going to get to a point where we've bought all the open space we're going to buy and we're going to turn all our attention now to just uh, stewardship of the lands that we own? Um, I tried to guesstimate that for you. So with the fee and the conservation easements that we um, have currently um, purchased, I would say we're about at 70% of, of where we want to be with our acquisitions. So we're not there yet. Um, but we're getting, we're getting there. Uh, it, and then in the next three to five years, um, I currently know of five properties that we are um, interested in looking at, could be potential deals for us. And together, the, these add up to 280 acres and would cost $6.2 million just for the land. There may be important water rights associated with those, which would um, up that price. Uh, also identified is 450 acres of conservation easements, totaling six properties, some of which need to be completed on our existing open spaces. We um, completed the purchase of the Olander farm early in 2024, and we, have, we are working to put a conservation easement over that property per city council's direction in 2016 to uh, encumber all of our open spaces with uh, conservation easements for the additional protections that they provide. Um, other acquisition priorities for the open space um, program include water. Uh, we have an open space water portfolio and we use it for our agricultural properties. Uh, we use it to keep uh, water in stream, so in stream flow rights. And it's, I, I wouldn't call it strong at the moment. We do need more water and that costs money. So that's something that our, uh, that our division is focusing on. And then another important aspect of the program is the multimodal transportation piece. Um, the open space program works on two of the eight and five projects um, that are coming up. The St. Vrain Greenway phase 12, so this will be the last phase of the Greenway going west from our Golden Ponds property and then connecting into Boulder County's trail system. And then the Union Reservoir Interim Trail, which will be built um, in the interim before uh, the Union Reservoir Master Plan improvements are put in place. Um, and that, that project has um, got a cost of $1.5 million. And then we're currently in design for the St. Vrain Greenway Phase 13, which I mentioned. Uh, as well as the County Road Multi-Use Trail, which is, will connect Union Reservoir to St. Vrain State Park and go through our, um, go, uh, through our Adam Farm property that we purchased in 2022. Um, this is an example of some of the planning we've done in the past. Um, these are stream reach corridors within the, the planning area, so, you know, open space does work on um, planning efforts um, 
not just on our open space proper. And then this is an illustration of our primary greenways in Longmont. Um, those that are complete and those are, that are still being worked on, there are 11. And then um, in terms of open space funding, the stewardship aspect of our program, um, something that gets talked about maybe a little less than the acquisition aspect of our program, but this is actually a quite expensive piece of our program, stewarding the lands that um, we have in our portfolio. Um, the annual operating cost for, for the staff and um, to do that is $2.1 million. And um, acres. Um, we estimate that on an annual basis, we are stewarding 1,500 acres of our open spaces property, and that is not to mention properties that are not open spaces. And it costs between seven and ten thousand um, dollars per acre to do that in the uplands, and even more when we're talking about um, creek channels. So I put some estimates in there. So if we're going to um, steward 1,500 acres of our open spaces in a year, that's $10.5 million for the uplands. And then if we're going to do, for example, on Spring Gulch uh, 2, we had to pare down what we wanted to do there. We were just doing channel reshaping. That's uh, $1.5 million. And there are other things that we could have done, but that would have um, increased the cost. Then we work on um, paying our annual water assessments for our open space uh, portfolio, conservation easements, and um, e this is just, we get a return on investment for our open spaces. They do sequester carbon, and I missed Harold's meeting that day, but there was a presentation that talked about and gave a stat on that. I can't remember. <laughs> it's, it, yeah, so, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to give somebody else's stat when I wasn't even there, but there was a per acre um, CO2 sequ sequestration. Um, so that's an important piece of open space. Another return on investment from our program is um, the Open Spaces Volunteer and Education Program. So um, in 2023, we had 69 events. We could have had 18 more, but we had rain, if you remember last spring lots and lots of rain it canceled 18 of our event our events and yet we had a thousand over a thousand volunteers which added up to 4500 service hours we have 24 community partners in that program so it's very popular and they're bringing back a value of 144 thousand dollars into the into our community um, and the kids fishing program, which is educational and fun for the community, we've over the years we've passed out 5,000 fishing rods. Um, that's a very fun program. And then in terms of agricultural open spaces and stewardship, we have costs associated with infrastructure and deferred maintenance. Um, we're working with various tenant farmers to do center pivot irrigation systems. Um, those have a cost associated with them. An example um, also is doing the deferred maintenance. So on our Bogot farm, we've got a drain tile install that's $15,000. Um, other things that we fund are our agricultural lease management. So here you can see in the orange, I'm putting some of the council priorities next to these. Um, again, the multimodal transportation and recreation are uh, um, extremely important pieces of the program. Um, we've got in there, we've got a ranger program and so they're patrolling our open spaces and greenways. Mm -hmm. We've got the, the recreation pieces at Union um, Reservoir and McIntosh Lake, for example. Uh, we're constructing greenways. I showed you those primary greenways earlier. And again, our water portfolio gets at the climate action uh, council priority. And, and then just in general, open spaces are important green spaces for wildlife habitat and travel corridors. Uh, nature areas that are nearby to our residents um, within the Longmont planning area um, and riparian corridors and in-stream flows and um, they serve a purpose uh, especially the um, open spaces outside the Longmont planning area to 
shape our community and keep us separate from the nearby our nearby neighbors. So when we bought that Olander farm earlier this year, it it was um, it was us or Mead, and we we purchased it and then we shaped our community up in that corner, and did not get a Mead development happening in that area. Um, However, it was a, a dry farm that we bought, so we were not able to purchase the water rights with that farm. So we are looking to buy water um, to make that farm whole and operating. Um, so some of the future challenges and then future opportunities, and then we come to the end. Uh, rising costs is a challenge with the open space program because as I've illustrated, acquiring and maintaining open spaces is getting more expensive every year. Um, and we see that when we have an opportunity to buy an open space and then maybe the deal doesn't go through and then five years later we have an opportunity again. For example, the Olander, while well, the price has gone up, it doesn't ever go down. Mm -hmm. um, so the open space sales and use tax funds the program in terms of ongoing funding, so it pays for the majority of everything that the open space program does, everything I just talked about. So it is needed now and beyond um, 2034. Um, we also have other sources of, of one-time re revenue, but these are um, temporary and fluctuating oil and gas revenue. Um, partner relationships, we can leverage grant dollars. Um, the Longmont open spaces get heavy use, and so we're always determining how to best manage, maintain, and steward these open spaces. Um, we, you know, we've heard a lot about this tonight, growth and housing. Um, and as Longmont continues to grow, the importance and the impact to open spaces is also increasing, but the importance of having these open spaces here for our community is also as important as it ever was. And so some opportunities, uh, our open space program turns 25 in a few years, maybe an opportunity to celebrate, um, bring attention to our program. Uh, we love to collaborate with partners when we do our work. Um, education and engagement um, is an ex extremely important um, part, educating our community and it's, it's becoming a bigger, bigger part of our volunteer program and um, all of our events are filling up with wait lists filling up. People, people are um, really appreciating that piece of our program. Um, there's room for improvement, flood uh, mitigation improvement, hazard management on existing acres, uh, restoring I've talked a lot about. We've got open spaces that have past land management on them and we'll take um, time and effort to restore. Um, and so without increasing, um, but securing ongoing and expanded funding for the open space program, we can continue to do our work um, to steward and coexist with wildlife, protecting habitat corridors, um, building regional trails and multimodal transportation, supporting soil and water conservation and regenerative agricultural practices. Um, when we when we protect an agricultural open space, we're protecting our history and our heritage. Um, and when we get the water rights associated with that, we're per protecting historic um, water rights. That's all I have. Um, hopefully I went fast enough that there's a little time for questions if you would like. Thank you. Um, thank you, this was great. And I, I had to go back and think about, okay, why did I have you bring that up? And I just hearing, I, it, we came not long after we had a discussion on housing um, in council and hearing from residents who were concerned about that balance that we're just growing and growing and growing and we don't have these spaces. But then when we look at that map, I mean, it's, it's really showing that yes, there, there are these spaces. And you know, something that was very informative to me was not just the acquisition of land, but that ongoing sustainability and maintaining of that that property. Like we just we just don't acquire it and leave it. So there's there's money that needs to go into um, taking care of that that land. Um, so I do see Council Member Martin's hand up. So I will go ahead and defer to you. 
Um, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I uh, I'm going to lower my hand so I don't forget it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I I think as as you pointed out, the this income stream, this revenue stream, has two really important pur purchase purposes. One of them is acquiring new land for open space. Uh, and the other, and in my mind more important, is, is the stewardship of the land, um, making it available to uh, residents for recreation, making the agricultural lands, make sure that they are working form, farms that, that do things like sequester carbon. Um, and uh, I, in, in, you know, minor land use skirmishes that have gone on over the time that I've been on council, we have, uh, I've had the opportunity to see um, what happens when land uh, held by other open space aggregators is perhaps um, not maintained as well as it could be and stewarded as well as it should, could be with the result that it is not doing what it's supposed to do um, in terms of preserving agricultural land or, or providing nature preserves. So I don't want Longmont to ever, ever be guilty of that. And I think that that is uh, a reason why I would so certainly support the, the um, continuation of the funding that is necessary for the stewardship of Longmont portfolio of open spaces. And we need to look at that very carefully. Um, on the other hand, I also think that we need to look at the um, proposed new acquisitions and what our opportunities to do about that are. You know, on the, oh, we don't want, as as the example you you gave, we don't we we don't want mead coming up on our eastern. Uh, boundary of, of our planning area, and we definitely want to have open space in between. Um, on the other hand, are there um, are there land acquisitions that could be used to be annexed into our planning area on the eastern border, rather than being open space? And uh, is I guess what I'm saying is is that when we bring this forward. Um, I would like to see some analysis around how much of the remaining unheld land must be open space acquisitions and which of it could be used in other ways um, to reduce the amount of land that we have to maintain in perpetuity and possibly may also be able to host uh, other amenities and housing uh, for the city of Longmont. So is that being you know, you've got a good picture of, of um, I think, everything except the proposed acquisitions and where it goes, where, where it sits with respect to adjacency to the planning area. And, and before we vote on it, I would really, uh, or, or, you know, refer the, refer the, I guess it's, re, we're referring the new, ta the continuation of the tax to the ballot. Is that correct? No, I'm just yeah. here for um, open space education tonight. I'm not asking anything of okay, council. Okay, yes, no, not, yeah, not tonight. We're not doing that, but that's gonna happen, right? We're, that's what we're asking for. So, uh, so let me jump in. I, I think there's two things happening on this. One, um, in yeah. public invited to be heard, we did have members of our community that indicated that they would be coming forward with that request um, in two weeks. Uh, uh, when we have an in, the entire council there, I think tonight what um, Danielle is going over is really a state, uh, you know, the past, present, and the future of open space. I think the common theme between this is the fact that um, when we look at what we purchase from open space and we look at the operational requirements and those issues, um, and look at the opportunities for open space. For example, there may be some areas where um, it may be along a river and it's a floodway, and, but it's still that buffer and some other. It, so I think what we're saying is, um, and as I look at this operationally, 
and you look to the future, there's a sunset provision on, uh -huh. on the open space tax. And when we're looking at how do you fund the ongoing maintenance of the open space that we've acquired over time and look at these targeted acquisitions, there's an issue coming at us in the future in terms of we've got to pay for it some way. And, um, <laughs> And we're even now in budget processes when, we, you know, this is more getting into what you're going to see. But when we look at the operational piece associated with this, you know, there's requests coming in and we have to be really judicious because we also know when that sunset is occurring. And, and in terms of operational items that we put in, ongoing dollars versus one time, we're pretty careful. And then sometimes we do bring in general fund dollars to to assist with that in terms of the management if needed. So I think what you heard in, in Danielle's presentation is, you know, this is the first time we're telling you in this, yes, the operational issues are coming and we need to start thinking about how we're gonna do with, deal with that in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for clarifying that, uh, Harold, because that's exactly what I was driving at. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and I was um, hoping that we could see some quantified scenarios um, because I would like Longmont to plan to be good stewards of the land we hold, whatever that turns out to be as open space in perpetuity. Um, on the other hand, I'm not averse to putting different limits than our protections, which again, are, are not, they're not really statutory at this point, what, what the limits or goals are to our acquisitions. Is that, is that correct, Daniel? That we never actually set specific goals. If I understand you correctly, Council Member Martin, I believe that is correct. Okay. But, yeah. uh, but we do have parameters that we look at when we are considering uh, purchasing open space, if they're meeting the, the, the tenants of uh, our program and if it's an appropriate purchase. Yes, and, um, and again, because, of, be, because land is at such a premium and because we do want to be sure that we um, can be good stewards of what we hold without overtaxing the public, I'd like to see those two issues separated out and the amount of acquisitions that are necessary uh, in, in addition to what we hold now um, better quantified and, um, and uh, how, how big the tax needs to be just to maintain what we have at the level of quality that we do now. Okay, I, if, if I could respond to that, Council Member Martin, a little bit. Um, it's difficult um, to bring um, potential acquisitions to a public meeting because there's a lot of uh, part of the process that needs to go on before it can be made public. Um, so that's going to be, and then, you know, th things come up and can be planned on in the next three to five years, like the five properties I mentioned. Uh, but yes. then there are things where we've been, you know, l landowners approached us 15 years ago um, and then they call us up one day and they say, okay, we're ready, you know, and then that's not something that we had planned for or budgeted for necessarily and, and that's coming up. And so those types of things happen in our acquisition day to day as well. I, I understand that, and I, I very much understand why we can't uh, and, and don't want to list specific parcels that, are, that have, we've set our sights on, because that increases their price. But, um, but what I do want to understand is, is specifically the cost of maintaining what we, uh, the projected cost of maintaining what we already hold, um, and as you know, you had this rough um, estimate of 30% of, uh, more above what we already hold. And um, without naming specific par parcels, I would be real interested in um, putting some rails on that and, and, you know, could it be as little as 10%? Could it as, you know, um, because the way you're describing the process, um, you know, it, it would, 
allow us to acquire land on the other side of Mead, for example, which probably ought to be off the table. Um, and, and so uh, I, I just, you know, it's, it's very open-ended the way you describe it now. And if, if we are going to be hearing, uh, uh, you know, referring to the ballot a tax, uh, a continuation of this tax, then we should know what it's going to pay for. So um, let me jump in, Daniel. I think a couple of things. One, obviously, we heard that a group is going to be bringing that request to the council. I think once that request comes to the council, then we can take these questions mm -hmm. and refine it. Um, I think I looked over at Eugene and um, and you said what I was about to say is that when we're looking at the, the acquisitions, we don't necessarily want to talk about those in public because that does impact price and mm -hmm. competition for that. So mm -hmm. um, I think once we get to that point, I, uh, we can work with Danielle and team and, and break it into buckets that are also generic enough. And one of the things that we're not talking about in this is when you talk about acquisition, one of the strategies that we've used since I've been here is actually utilizing a debt strategy where you also issue debt to do that. So you're minimizing your revenues in terms of you're not just acquiring cash basis, you're utilizing debt, which then allows more money to go into operations. So there's also different financial strategies that we can utilize. Yes, thank you. And that's, I'm just trying to foreshadow all of that. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I do see Council Member McCoy. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem uh, Hidalgo Ferrin. Danielle, you've done a wonderful job of uh, presenting this. I, I want you to know, you know, uh, just about a year ago, June 22nd, my father passed away. But one of the things uh, that he was most proud of was his involvement with uh, open space and. And uh, we talked about that over and over again. And as an intern for Ron Stewart and a Boulder County Open Space Commissioner at one point myself, I can tell you that this is probably one of the most important things. And as we heard tonight from the LEDP uh, uh, and uh, from Visit Longmont, how important uh, the recreational aspects and the commercial aspects of, 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 uh, of connecting this and seeing the uh, you know why people want to move here their businesses and their and their lives and everything to Longmont and it just keeps coming back to that quality of life that open space provides I think of all the people that walk every morning around Macintosh and and uh, and paddle and uh, and play in Macintosh and in Union Reservoir and I uh, you know was one of the first uh, uh, park rangers out at Union years and years ago when it was first acquired. And so I, I really know this is one of the things that uh, we uh, are, you know, it's one of our crown jewels of our community. And so uh, I think the group uh, stand with our St. Vrain Creek, uh, you know, they'll be coming forward with uh, their proposal. And I think uh, uh, we can have these other conversations like uh, Harold was indicating. But, uh, you know, I think, uh, um, the group was only really talking when they presented it last night to uh, Prab about the idea of maintaining it and just making it permanent, not trying to micromanage it or trying to uh, create something that wasn't there or confuse the public on something that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, and indicating somehow it was more uh, there than, than that actually meets the eye. So, uh, I think we, we just need to stay focused here. We'll wait and hear what they have to say on the 25th. And, uh, and thank you again for everything you presented tonight. Thank you. Thank you. This was great. And I'll probably see you this Friday for great. the field thank trip. You. Thank you yeah. for that segue. Uh -huh. um, we talked a lot about um, what it takes to steward and restore open spaces. And there's still time to sign up for our open space tour on Friday. The open space tour starts at 10 a.m., right? It starts at 10 a.m. We're meeting at the upper parking lot at Sandstone, and um, we'll uh, take the tour from there. I think we're scheduled to get you back at 1 p.m. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we are now at final call, public invited to be heard. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak? 
Come on down. <laughs> Good evening again, uh, third time. It's me, uh, Faraz Sharar from Western Longmont, Colorado, off North 75th Street. And I just want to say that I am um, happy uh, to be, to be, how do I put it? Um, I'm, gl oh. I'm glad to say this. I stand corrected. On agenda 10A, um, no, it was not a tax. That was my ignorance. It was a fee step set by um, uh, phone companies and the state decades ago in the 80s. Um, since 911 was developed in Alabama, yay, good for you, Dixie. Anyway, um, and. It's beyond a worthy cause. It's for emergency services. So the only gripe anybody would be having is with uh, increase in the rate, and that's, I guess, due to inflation. Um, just a quick note about open spaces. Uh, well, yes, begrudgingly, I'm, I'm not, I'm reluctant on taxes and everything, uh, and everything that would have to go to our services in our city. I would have to say I would support worthy causes like open spaces because I believe we got to protect our open space. We got to protect our farmland and I'm out of line for saying this, uh, Indian country as well. And while yes, costs are very important and it brings up a dilemma, thank you Councillor Martin for bringing up these concerns while I I have to say, you're not wrong. Uh, one thing I you know we touched on a little about the space is water. Uh, what are we going to do about the shortage of water? There's water scarcity. I pray to God every day that our farmers get water for our crops and that Lake Mead and the Colorado River system is replenished because I'm scared that we're going through a drought and we only have so much water in our community, never mind our planet. So. I just feel like with open spaces, um, rather than expanding rapidly with housing development, that's the best way to preserve, if not grow, our water, our source to life. Um, so I guess that's all I got for tonight. Uh, thank you. Great. Thank you. Turn that off. Okay. And do we have any count? Um, oh, yeah. Come on down. <laughs> Not looking, thank you. Dan Wolford, 1815 3rd Avenue. What I saw was tonight, at least in Visit Longmont, you saw many of the slides that had wildlife, mm -hmm. you know, and much of it was local wildlife. One of the, I think Danielle did a great job and Jim, great job of providing the presentation. One of the elements that I believe was kind of missed was the urban wildlife management that the Open Space Program does. The Ur Jim's work staff is responsible for the management of prairie dogs throughout all of city's public lands, as well as all the fisheries in all our lakes and ponds, coordinating that with Colorado Division of Parks and Wildlife. The, the wildlife biologist is monitoring 40 raptor nests throughout the city and, and managing that, um, as well as beaver control when the you know, beavers were damming up our ditches and um, riverways. So a lot of time is spent by staff um, doing planning, master planning, wildlife management plan, working with CPW on Preble's uh, meadow jumping mouse plan. So that's an important element. Finally, I would strongly encourage you to attend Friday's meeting of the open space and see the beauties that you've preserved over time. And again, I greatly appreciate your support of the open space program and the support that you you provided me over my career here with the city of Longmont. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going on to council comments. Anyone? Okay, so let's see. So the first one, seat six, that would be council member Chris. Oops. Right there, that was the first one that popped on mine. Well, it's topical for tonight. I have a constituent who would like to speak to council. Um, she is almost completely deaf, 
but she was a hearing um, hearing enabled person during her life and lost her hearing um, due to age. And so she doesn't sign. Um, she's most able to talk uh, through a translator or what we might call closed captioning. She also needs a little bit more of an intimate setting to where she can see faces to see if she's speaking loud enough. And, um, and so I'm throwing this out here because I've had conversations with her through a translator. Um, and um, she wants to talk about aging in place and the uh, issues she's having, particularly with her disability and her age and the changes in the neighborhood and the changes in, in the cost of living. So um, the things that staff has come up with is um, maybe one-on-ones with each um, counselor, or um, maybe just in a smaller setting, say at a pre-session when we're in the study room. Um, and if we can figure out a way to put some translation on the screen for her. So I just want to make you aware of it, I'm not asking for any action, um, and we'll just um, that we're working on it and to be determined. Um, thank you. Um, Council Member McCoy. Thank you, Mayor Pertim Hidalgo Farron. Um, tonight we heard from uh, the Senior uh, Citizens Advisory Board, and the, one of the issues that came up was the closed captioning. And I'm always a little bit hesitant on that because it's oftentimes not closed captioning, but close captioning. And <laughs> that, that's a little concerning because sometimes that can be, you know, say the wrong thing up on the screen. So uh, I, I think we have to look and see uh, a little bit more carefully about in chambers closed captioning and uh, that just because of the fact that it, it does sometimes uh, end up being more like close captioning. So, so uh, if I can jump in real quick, one of the things I did want to remind people is we did upgrade our, our um, system here um, in terms of the um, headphones that folks can wear when they're when they're in session um, Yes, we have been testing that and um, It is not always accurate um, and so uh, But one of the things to the point that councilmember Chris brought up is when we know about these issues we do have connections with um, a it's an it's an accessibility issue which we're obligated to work through and we work with different groups in terms of uh, managing those accessibility issues. So the more time we have, the better we can plan so that we can ensure that we're assisting those individuals in the best way possible. So, um, so now it's to you. Do you have any other comments, city manager? No, no comments. Okay, <laughs> thank you, city attorney. No comments, Mayor Pro Tem. Okay, so, okay, wonderful. Second, Second. okay. <laughs> Very good. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Um, there we go. Meeting adjourned.